Hello and welcome to my channel. I am Daisy, your hostess. I have a question for you before we get started on this book. If someone was offering you tools that you can use to make the journey of life better, would you take them? It would seem like that's a no-brainer, right? Yet it is in so many great books that we can find the answers and we have people that have led the way to show us the challenges, the disciplines, the process. What I've learned is that too often people fail to look at what was happening behind the scene, the hours of sacrifice, the self-discipline, the development of the person, the soul, the character. And all we see is what? <laughs> the end result, the sparkly. We see them with the big houses, the shining cars, the families, all the vacations or whatever it is that we see. But nonetheless, we fail to see what did they do? And I have learned that success leaves clues. And that's what I aim to bring in the hopes that maybe you land upon a book that is going to offer you that golden nugget that will help you succeed in whatever task that may be that you are involved in at this stage of your life. And I'm very happy to be a part of that journey also. All right, let's go into this next chapter titled Believe in Yourself. Fundamental to success in any vocation, whatever is self-confidence. Unless a man believes firmly in his ability to succeed, he cannot achieve much. And unfortunately, the tendency of many people is to personal underestimation. Looking about them, in fact, the generality of men fix their gaze wonderingly on some outstanding figure in their line of work, some acknowledged leader. I wish I could do what he has done, they say to themselves. But it is of course impossible. He had advantages I have never had. He was better endowed by inheritance than I, enjoyed a better education. Mine is a pygmy mind compared with his. He is a born genius. That is why he has prospered. This is the attitude consciously or unconsciously taken by most people. Nor is it surprising, in view of the belittling influences to which many are subjected from their earliest days. In childhood, their natural aptitudes unstudied, they are pitchforked into a rigid educational system making next to no allowance for individual trends. Parents and teachers finding them misfits in such a system, but not appreciating the desirability of modifying the system, combined not so much to help them as to fill their minds with ideas of inferiority. They are reproached for their dullness. Other children who happen to fit better into the school curriculum are extolled as superior beings certain to travel fast and far, while they, the inferiors, lag behind. Later, the terrible teachings of the heredity fanatics impinge upon them with crushing force. They now know what is the matter with them. If they did not get along in school, and they unmistakably did not, it was because they were born in some degree mentally defective. The best they can hope for is to earn a difficult living in a subordinate role. Thus, influenced to disbelieve in themselves, they are fated to mediocrity and obscurity unless a happy chance intervene, as it often does, to awaken them to a belated realization that they can accomplish more than they have thought possible. Otherwise, they continue to flounder, continue futilely to marvel at their more successful fellows, more successful largely for the reason that they have refused to acknowledge inferiority and have, through good fortune and ill, clung to the belief that they have it in them to succeed. I can and I will has been the creed of the victorious, whatever their origin, whatever the blessing or the blight of their heredity. With I can and I will, they have climbed to the heights, even despite the handicap of a family history that would fill an eugenist with dismay. Of course, there are limits, as the wise William James once pointed out. The trees don't grow into the sky. But the plain fact remains that men the world over possess amounts of resource which only very exceptional individuals push to their extremes of use. 
This doctrine of unused resources, of hidden powers, accessible to all if all would but learn to make use of them, is indeed one of the most important of modern psychological findings. And it is not based on theory merely. It is borne out by an abundance of facts of everyday observation and by the results of scientific researches which go to show, more specifically, that there is in the depths of every person's mind what may be figuratively be described as both a storehouse wherein are lastingly preserved all of life's experiences and also a factory for the creation of ideas. The psychologists call this wonderful region of the mind the subconscious, and for the past quarter of a century many of them have been industriously exploring it. Of particular significance to the men eager to get on in the world is the new light their investigations have thrown on the faculties of observation, memory, and imagination. Perhaps you who read these lines account yourself most unobserving, forgetful, and unimaginative. The truth of the matter seems to be that the subconscious part of you perceives everything that comes within range of your sense organs, forgets nothing, and is uncommonly imaginative, as is, for example, strikingly demonstrated in the familiar phenomenon of dreams. Certainly your dreams are not prosaic commonplaces. They are imaginative in the extreme, sometimes to an almost incredible degree. Yet they are unmistakably the product of your own mind. You are indebted for them to nobody but yourself, and they point directly to the possession by you of a faculty susceptible of cultivation in your waking moments and of practical helpfulness to you in the winning of success. You have had, everybody has had, dreams of romantic and thrilling adventure. In your sleep, you have composed stories surpassing in interest any a novelist could give you and holding you fascinated, not least because you yourself have been the central figure in them. You have built for yourself dream houses, excelling in beauty the best architect's creations. You have fashioned landscapes more glorious than were ever seen by you on painter's canvas. Again and again, you have had dreams compelling you to acquiesce in the exclamation of a New York friend of mine. People talk of dreams as at best mere jumbles of fragments of memory, where my beautiful buildings, streets, rooms, objects of art, armor, mere jumbles? Their orderly arrangements as well as their beauty have not been equaled in my waking experience. On occasions, it is true, you have found yourself waking in fright from your dreams. Not Edgar Allan Poe himself could inspire in you the dread that certain visions of the night have inspired. But, splendid or appalling, gladsome or grim, your dreams remain pictures and stories and dramas of your own making, the results of creative imagination, of your creative imagination. How explain them? Also, how explain the discrepancy between the vigor of your imagination in sleep and its inertia deplored by you during your waking life? It can only be that you possess reserves of mental power on which you are free to draw in sleep, but on which you make no real effort to draw in wakefulness because you are unappreciative of their presence. Yet, clearly, these same reserves, if you could but learn to use them, would become immeasurably more useful to you in wakefulness than in sleep. For in wakefulness, reason is on the alert, as it is not in sleep, to direct your imagination and apply it to serviceable ends. Many dreams, moreover, bear amazing witness to the power of the sense organs to perceive and to register on the wonderful mechanism of the memory, even things seen or heard without conscious awareness, of the seeing or hearing. Experimentally, too, the almost unbelievable range of subconscious perception and the tenacity of subconscious memory have repeatedly been demonstrated through the aid of hypnotism, automatic writing, and crystal gazing, 
phenomena with which physical research has done much to familiarize the public. Again and again, persons when hypnotized, when writing automatically, or when gazing into a crystal, have made statements or seen in their crystals pictures relating to matters forgotten by them perhaps for years, and even matters concerning which they could honestly but mistakenly affirm never to have had knowledge. The same strange faculty of subconscious perception and subconscious memory has, indeed, been amply proved without resort either to experiment or to the evidence of dreams. So that today, one would seem well warranted in declaring that nothing that has once entered the mind through the sense organs is ever really forgotten, however completely it may have faded from conscious recollection. Footnote. For detailed instances supporting these statements, see earlier books, The Riddle of Personality and Adventurings in the Psychical. End footnote. Your own mind, you may rest assured, contains in its subconscious region a vast collection of material connected with things once seen or heard by you but forgotten, and under favoring circumstances capable of emergence into the conscious region. This is a fundamental fact to keep in view. Keep in view also the further fact that as suggested above, the subconscious does not merely register and retain sense impressions. It possesses the faculty of working over whatever material is given it by the sense organs and under suitable conditions of unexpectedly presenting to the upper consciousness the product of its secret labors. Proof of this is found in the frequently recorded instances of the dream solution of mathematical and other problems and in the gaining during sleep of ideas afterward embodied in literary, artistic, musical, or scientific works. A precisely similar uprush of creative ideas from the subconscious may also occur during waking moments. This is what I particularly desire to impress upon you, for I want you to appreciate that you yourself can profit remarkably from subconscious uprushes in your everyday life, and that only in proportion as you develop and make use of the resources of your subconscious can you hope to progress satisfactorily. And those men who you so greatly admire, the men who have attained noteworthy success in their chosen callings, owe their success chiefly to the extent to which they supplement conscious effort by subconscious mental action. If they are superlatively successful men, men of genius, as the phrase is, they are apt to appreciate and acknowledge their debt to their subconscious. Many, in fact, have acknowledged it. One does not work, one listens, De Musset once said, in answer to a question as to his usual method of work. It is as though another person were speaking into one's ear. It is not I who think, said Lamartine. It is my ideas that think for me. Schiller, according to his biographer, Vischer, declared that when he deliberately set himself to create and construct, his imagination seemed shackled and did not respond to his desire with the same freedom as when nobody was looking over its shoulder. Similar citations might be made in great number. And as with writers and composers, so with scientists and inventors. Some of the greatest of human discoveries, for example, the discovery of the law of gravitation and the theory of evolution, have demonstrably been due to an unexpected upsurging from the subconscious. So frequently has this been the case that there is abundant warrant for insisting that, after all, the chief thing which distinguishes the man of genius is his readiness of access to his subconscious. And, note this well, men of genius have always been great believers in themselves. Between their supreme self-confidence and their uncommon energizing, there would indeed seem to be a direct connection. But, you may object. The conceited also are great believers in themselves, yet do not stand out as men of genius. Quite true. Self-confidence alone is by no means a guarantee of resplendent success. 
certain other qualities must be developed too, as it is my purpose to make clear to you. Without self-confidence, however, it is unlikely that these other qualities will ever be developed in any high degree. You must believe in yourself, must believe in the power latent in you, if you would have that power advantage you as it can. End of chapter 2. Stay right here. I am going to roll right through to chapter 3, titled How Ideas Come. And take a minute, please. Hit that like button. Let me know you're here. Leave me a comment. I really love reading your comments. And if you haven't done so, subscribe to the channel. Okay, here we go. How Ideas Come. To say, as I have said, that men of genius owe their achievements chiefly to the extent to which they supplement conscious effort by subconscious mental action is by no means to say that a man of genius is essentially of different constitution from the ordinary man. Every man, as a matter of fact, has some degree of access to his subconscious in his waking as in his sleeping moments. Take your own case as an illustration. Over and over again, it is safe to say, you have had ideas unexpectedly occur to you, ideas of some value, if only to the extent of enabling you to earn a little more money or to save a little more money. The common experience of spontaneous recollection of a forgotten name is itself an instance of an upsurging from the subconscious. You have, perhaps, cudgeled your mind for hours to bring back the name of an acquaintance with whom you wish to get into touch. All your efforts are in vain. But later, possibly at a dinner party, when your thoughts are concerned with something of altogether different character, the desired name suddenly presents itself to you coming seemingly from nowhere, but actually from a corner of your subconscious, where it has been faithfully preserved together with all other facts gleaned in the course of your life. And to be sure, its recall means less to you than would a subconscious upsurging that made you the fortunate possessor of some highly original idea. The principle, however, is the same. You have been able to recall the forgotten name because you have had access to your subconscious. And the name is in your subconscious to be recalled because it is an acquisition you have gained by previous conscious mental action. May not it be, then, that the reason your subconscious upsurgings are inferior to those of people more successful than you have yet been is that you have not been at equal pains to provide your subconscious with the raw material for superior upsurgings. Obviously, however potent the subconscious may be, it cannot obtain superlatively fine results with scanty or inferior working material. And if the eminently successful owe much to ease of access to their subconscious, it is certain that they labor with prodigious diligence to give their subconscious an abundance of excellent material for its creative activities. As I have emphasized in my book on psychology and parenthood, quote, all men of genius have been great workers, even when, as has been observed in certain cases, they indulge in more or less protracted periods of idleness, they later make amends by an unusual industry. And for that matter, their idleness, after all, is more seeming than real. Ardent, whole-souled absorption in the thing he has set himself to do. That, unquestionably, is a distinguishing characteristic of the man of genius. It is almost as if, by instinct, he labors hard to provide his subconscious with the data it must have in order to afford him, by way of recompense, those flashes of insight, those moments of inspiration that mean acknowledged leadership among his fellow man." End quote. And there is a phrase in this passage I would repeat for your benefit. Ardent, whole-souled absorption in the thing he has to do. Can you truthfully say of your attitude toward your own work that it is one of ardent, whole-souled absorption? Are you anything like as interested in your work as all notably successful men have been in theirs? And these questions 
are of vital significance to you. For though hard work is indispensable to the highest success, it must be hard work motivated by interest if success is to be won. Hard work, one may say, is what secures for the subconscious a plentitude of raw material. Interest is the spark which sets the processes of the subconscious in full motion. Precisely as nobody ever solved during sleep a problem in which he was not interested, so no man of genius ever had a waking inspiration with regard to anything to which he had not previously given keenly interested attention and thought. Robert Louis Stevenson's do not receive inspirations in biology and Charles Darwin's are uninspired as regards works of fiction. All are rewarded by their subconscious according to the special interest felt and the degree of conscious effort to which that interest impels. Besides, it is important for you to be keenly interested in your work if only to prevent that work from becoming drudgery to you. Drudgery has been defined as occupation divorced from immediately satisfying motive. Put more tersely, drudgery is work which does not give pleasure. Develop a sufficiently keen interest, pleasure will follow, and then there can be no drudgery. But, you ask, how am I to develop the sufficiently keen interest? Patience. We shall come to that presently. My chief anxiety at the present moment is to persuade you of the intimate connection that assuredly exists between interest and the gaining of original ideas. Compare with your own intensity of interest and conscious effort in your work, the intensity of interest and the conscious effort of those whose names rank high in history's annals. The mighty Napoleon, his biographies assure us, was so intensely interested in military problems that he thought about them most of the time. Even at the opera, he often forgot the music in pondering problems of strategy. Besides which, through ambassadors, secret diplomatic agents, and other aides, he maintained a remarkable information bureau. No modern general of industry makes more systematic use of data gathering and data recording methods than Napoleon made. He had a confidential secretary, Dalby, whose business it was to classify, file, and summarize incoming reports. These Napoleon personally used, studying them with infinite diligence. Mozart, the same Mozart who has informed us that his compositions came involuntarily like dreams, lived in an atmosphere of music. Nobody runs his statement, takes as much pains in the study of composition as I. You could not easily name a famous master in music whom I have not industriously studied, often going through his works several times. Likewise with all men of genius of whose lives we have detailed records. One and all, their biographies go to bear out the view that, in order to harness the subconscious, so to speak, in order to draw profitably all the resources of the mind, intense interest plus insistent effort is the prime essential. Interest alone will not suffice. Neither will effort alone. The two must be in combination. It is most important for you to appreciate this, else you may fall into the common error of thinking that genius is, after all, mostly a matter of hard work of everlastingly sticking at it. The world is full of people who slave faithfully at their respective tasks, perhaps earn a handsome living, but know in their hearts that they have failed to achieve all they might. The trouble with them chiefly is that they are not dynamically interested in what they are doing. It may be, however, that they also err by sticking too persistently at work. Reference has already been made to the fact, stressed by their biographers, that many men of genius, hard workers though they may be, indulge occasionally in periods of complete idleness so far as conscious effort is concerned. 
all men of genius, as a matter of fact, from time to time stand at ease mentally. And in this, as well as their absorption in work while they are at work, you should follow their example both for physiological and psychological reasons. You must indeed do so if you would benefit to the full from your latent powers. For as the numerous instances of dream creation and of waking inspiration make very clear, relaxing of conscious attention is necessary if only to give the subconscious opportunity to communicate the results of its activities to the upper consciousness. Or, as phrased by T. Sharp and Olson in his remarkable suggestive work on originality, quote, One of the primary conditions of inspiration is that a period of close inquiry and reflection should be followed either by a change of subject or a period of mental inactivity. Idleness in sensible proportion gives the subconscious its opportunity. Close work, on the other hand, with its constant absorption of eye and brain, monopolizes the whole area of the waking mental life allowing few opportunities for transitions from the subconscious to the conscious. Also, there is a sense in which strenuous mental effort to arrive at a scientific solution or to phrase a haunting line of poetry is profoundly unpsychological, unless relief is sought in recreation or idleness. The subconscious must have time to exercise its creative power. And, A wise thinker keen on any kind of discovery never wearies himself to exhaustion by pursuing one line of investigation to the exclusion of every other, unceasingly, unrestingly. He knows that after careful work, he can safely leave the subconscious activities to contribute their share to the final solution. End quote. which, of course, is itself sufficient reason that every man should have some hobby or pleasurable avocation to which he can turn if it be only a hobby for taking walks. And by the way, walking is to many people of distinct value as an idea bringer. As a famous scientist once made answer to an inquiring friend, my best ideas do not come to me when I am hard at work in the laboratory. They come when I'm abstractedly listening to music or strolling about my garden thinking of nothing in particular. Not a few writers, in fact, have made it more or less of a habit to compose while walking. This was the way, for example, with John Stuart Mill, who worked out the greater part of his remarkable system of logic while walking to and from his place of business in the East India Company's office. Jules Payot, the famous French moralist whose book The Education of the Will, has helped so many thousands of people, attributes much of the clarity of his thinking to his habit of walking for the deliberate purpose of gaining ideas. I myself have found that when ideas refuse to come, when it seems impossible to plan new work or execute work already in hand, a brisk walk, preferably in a park or over a country road, will usually clear away my difficulties. The explanation is simple enough. It is grounded in the nature of our being, in the dependence of mental power on the state of the physical organism. When we walk, the circulation of the blood is quickened. The blood itself, flowing to and through the brain, is purified and invigorated by the oxygen breathed in with the fresh air of the street or road. Hence, the brain, the supreme organ of the mind, functions more vigorously. The power to think is thereby increased. There is this to be added, however. If walking be prolonged until fatigue sets in, then there is a harmful, not helpful action on the brain. For fatigue has the peculiar effect of generating poisonous substances which are carried by the blood to the brain. The man who would gain ideas by walking must accordingly be careful not to overdo his walking. It is because many men neglect this precaution that they fail to profit mentally by taking walks. They return to their desk, physically fatigued, and in consequence mentally fatigued likewise. Wrongly, they jump to the conclusion that it is better to avoid walking at all when one wishes to think. So they become sedentary thinkers, 
to their real loss. But whether or no you walk for the express purpose of gaining ideas, you must certainly relax in some way for that purpose. In fact, it is for several reasons important to relax momentarily at frequent intervals during the working day. If you do not, worse things may happen to you than failure to develop originality. This is especially likely to be the case if you allow yourself to become one of the numerous group of people who go through life day after day in a state of constant physical and mental tension. The moment they awake their muscles taunting and their mind springs into feverish activity, they do not relax even while eating their meals. On the streetcars, one sees them with tenses plainly written in their faces in their attitude. These people not merely lessen their chance for success. They not merely check the idea-creating activities off their subconscious. They are the people from whose ranks the nervously ill are recruited. As a specialist friend once remarked, hypertension is characteristic of nervous patients. Hypertension that is both muscular and mental. I constantly find it in those who come to me for advice and treatment. In order really to help them, it is necessary to develop in them the habit of frequent relaxation. Nobody whose organism is forever tense need hope to keep well or get well. Upon the other hand, once the habit of relaxation has been established, the resultant gain in vigor of body and mind is often truly astonishing. The plea may be raised, and frequently is raised, that hypertension is inevitable in these days of stress and strain. Life has become such a struggle. It presents so many causes of worry and anxiety that one necessarily is on edge all the time. Which does not alter the fact that to be on edge all the time is incompatible with mental poise and nervous balance. Nor is it really necessary to be perpetually on edge. Opportunities for relaxing present themselves every day, or they can be created on the way to and from work, while waiting to keep an appointment, in momentary pauses during one's work itself, in the luncheon hour. It is always possible to practice relaxation. The chronically hypertensed, to be sure, when beginning to acquire the relaxation habit, are likely to be troubled by the persistent intrusion of worrying thoughts or of thoughts connected with the work in hand. These must, of course, be banished, or true relaxation becomes impossible. But it will not do to meet them by, so to speak, a direct frontal attack. Instead of saying to oneself, I will not think of this or that, which only serves to keep the attention fixed on the thing not to be thought of, the effort should be made to substitute thoughts of a less stressful character. This is not hard to do. One has a host of pleasant memories on which to draw. It is easy to recall some amusing incident of the day before, a book recently read, a play recently seen, etc. Thus the thoughts making for tenseness may be sidetracked. After a time, moreover, it will be found quite possible not merely to substitute non-stressful thoughts for stressful ones, but to close shop mentally whenever one chooses. This is the ideal relaxation goal to be kept in view. It means a complete resting of the brain cells, which recuperate with marvelous facility when permitted to rest, if only for a few minutes at a time. And then work can be attacked with a new vigor and with results impossible to those who keep themselves under full steam the livelong day. Be sure, though, to attack your work with real vigor while you're at work. Don't go at it in any half-hearted fashion. Work much as the famous Daniel Webster, for example, used to work. One day, a brother lawyer consulted Webster about a complicated legal case. It was a case so complicated that the consulting lawyer had spent days trying to find a path through its maze of intricacies. Webster listened to his statements of facts and took from him the papers in the case. This was early in the morning. By noon, Webster had arrived at a definite and convincing opinion. Amazed at the seeming ease with which he had solved the problem, the other lawyer asked him how he had done it. By concentration, said Webster, in effect, 
by putting the whole power of my mind into the case you submitted to me. Long ago, he went on, I came to the conclusion that it is a law of nature that the body or mind that labors constantly must necessarily labor only indifferently well. It seemed to me, on the other hand, that the mind, like a racehorse, might be trained to an increasingly intensity of effort through frequent exercise followed by periods of entire rest. In this way, its power would be gradually increased, just as the speed of the racehorse is increased. Accordingly, I have made it a rule to think hard about any matter of importance that presents itself to me and to rest as soon as my mental vision begins to obscure. This alternation of effort and rest has, I know, meant much to me. Here is a hint for all workers. Many make the mistake of never thinking really hard. Others make the mistake of never giving themselves a real rest. They take their business problems to bed with them. Even when they leave home for what they call vacations, their minds still linger on their business cares. In both cases, the result is inability to develop any great mental power. The non-thinkers cannot reasonably expect to use their minds to advantage when any unusual demand is made on them. In a similar situation, the over-fatigued thinkers suffer from obscurity of mental vision as soon as they try to think. Webster's method of energizing himself is surely one that all might profitably adopt. It may not raise everybody to Webster's level of intellectual strength, but there can be no doubt that it will vastly increase the intellectual length of those who third of thinking too little or too much. Begin to make trial of it. Accustom yourself when a task is set you to focus your mind upon it. Banish all distracting thoughts. When you feel the need of rest, banish likewise from your mind the problem on which you have been concentrating. Then, when you tackle it again, you will be fresh for your renewal of labor. In time, you will find not merely that concentration of thought has become easier for you, but that you are thinking to better purpose. The alternation of hard thinking and rest through pleasurable diversion of mind, that is, I repeat, a sure recipe for mental growth. Your work itself, so far as that goes, should furnish your mind with pleasurable occupation. But what if it does not? What if you find it tedious and irksome? This brings us back to the question you raised a little while ago, the question of heightening one's interest in one's work. End of chapter. All right, hopefully you're grabbing some good nuggets here. And if you haven't done so, hit that like button. And let's over to the next video where we're going to learn more on self-development.